Hi YouTube, my name is Jack Chanick, and today I want us to talk about two fundamentally different approaches to the practice of magic. When we talk about magic, uh, we mean a lot of different things, right? Under the umbrella of occultism, witchcraft, sorcery, whatever words you want to use, Lots of us say that we're doing magic, but we do different kinds of things. And the project of defining and categorizing magic is infamously difficult. So Aleister Crowley defines magic as the art and science of causing change to occur in conformity with will. Um, Dion Fortune has sort of a weaker definition where she defines magic as the art of causing changes in consciousness to occur with will. Um, and then you have, you know, various sort of more practical definitions, and there are also various ways throughout history that people have tried to categorize magic and break it down. Uh, one of the most famous distinctions is given by Cornelius Agrippa in his three books of occult philosophy. This is the translation by Eric Perdue, by the way. It's absolutely fabulous. I could not recommend it highly enough. Um, Agrippa has three books of occult philosophy, each of which deals with a different type of magic. The first book deals with what he calls natural magic, then celestial or astrological magic, and then finally divine magic, magic involving God. Um, other than Agrippa, the Picatrix provides its own taxonomy of magic. Uh, interestingly enough, the Picatrix actually categorizes stage illusions as a legitimate type of magic. Um, which says all kinds of interesting things. Uh, but there's also a more recent division, um, Isaac Bonowitz, I think starting from Real Magic, which I don't have a copy of with me because I read it on Kindle, uh, but Real Magic comes out in 71, uh, something like that, 1971, maybe sometime in the 70s. Um, and Real Magic was, uh, you know, kind of this groundbreaking book in the 20th century study of magic, and Bonowitz talks, among other things, about a distinction between thaumaturgy and theurgy, low magic and high magic, wonder working and god working. So all of these are just different ways of trying to break down what magic is into discrete categories that we can understand in order to better sort of get our heads around this thing that we do. Um, and today I want to talk about a distinction that I don't see all that often, but I think is really present, is really implicit in the way that we talk about magic, and that is one of the most helpful ways that I have found to understand the distinctions, or to, to categorize, rather, magical practice. And that's the distinction between spirit-based and sympathetic forms of magic. So a lot of magic throughout history works through the intercession of non-corporeal spirits. Um, most of the Solomonic tradition involves summoning and commanding or, you know, supplicating, depending on the nature of the spirit you're working with, but, but summoning angels or demons or other kinds of spirits, and then in some way persuading them to help you get what you want. Uh, you see that in sort of the, like, you know, Key of Solomon type magic. You see that in uh, the lesser Key of Solomon, you know, Goetic Demon Summoning. Uh, you see that in, like, the Abramelin operation, right? So there are all sorts of magical operations from the grimoire tradition that fundamentally work on a model of summoning and interacting with spirits. Uh, there's actually a fabulous book by Stephen Skinner, which is on my bookshelf somewhere, and I don't see it right now, so I'm not going to grab it. Um, but uh, Stephen Skinner has a really fabulous book called Techniques of Solomonic Magic, which really goes into detail, sort of peeling apart the apparatus that is used to summon spirits in the Solomonic tradition. Um, outside of the Solomonic tradition, you also have things like Enochian magic, which involves, right, quite directly 
using showstone to scry and communicate with hierarchies of angels. Uh, and then even if you think about sort of more folk magic, folkloric witchcraft, um, any folklore about a familiar spirit or a fetch spirit, right, a spirit of some kind that does the bidding of the witch or magician in order to help them accomplish their magical goals, that's sort of a model of magic that is based on interaction with spirits. There are spirits out in the world that are more powerful than we are, so in order to get what we want, we communicate with those spirits and persuade them to help us. That's one model of magic. It's a very successful model, model of magic. It's a very strong model of magic. magic. Ugh, I just can't talk today. I'm gonna have some more tea. It's a very strong model of magic, and really importantly, it's been around for a very very long time. Mm. Now the other model of magic that I really commonly see is sympathetic magic. So sympathetic magic doesn't rely on the intercession of uh, another spirit, um, but rather it relies on the assumption that there are connections between things in the world that can be leveraged in some way. So that if two things are similar or are connected in some other way, uh, you can act upon one of them and produce an effect on the other. Uh, the term sympathetic magic originates in our dear friend James Fraser with his Golden Bough. Uh, and in the Golden Bough, Fraser talks about two main types of sympathetic magic, those being uh, homeopathic magic, so magic that works based on a principle of similarity. Think about like poppet magic where you, you make a figure of someone and then you manipulate that figure in some way and expect it to have a magical effect on the person. Or contagious magic, so magic where something that has been in contact with the target of your spell can be manipulated in a way that will affect them. So if you take like an article of clothing that someone wears uh, and you take that and then you do something magical with it in order to affect them. And that's really like the model of magic that James Fraser sets up. So a really classic example of sympathetic magic and one that comes out of the Golden Bough is the idea that when a baby is born you can plant the placenta under a sapling tree so that as the tree grows and becomes strong, the same thing will happen to the baby. Um, now, sympathetic magic sort of isn't only seen in James Fraser, right? It is actually genuinely a model on which a lot of folk magic, and not even folk magic, but magic around the world operates, right? So Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy, the first book of occult philosophy deals with natural magic. It deals with precisely this sort of thing, where there are certain magical properties endowed in stones or plants or other features of the natural world, and that you can draw on those similarities in order to produce certain magical effects. Um, any kind of image-based magic is also going to be, broadly speaking, falling under what I'm considering this category of sympathetic magic. So the talismanic magic that you find in something like the Picatrix is drawing on the virtues of particular images and particular arrangements of celestial bodies in order to produce an effect without necessarily the direct intervention of a spirit of some kind. Uh, you can also think about that with Solomonic pentacles, which once again are sort of drawing on a particular image and a particular power in order to, often a planetary power, in order to produce a certain effect. Now, importantly, the lines get blurry here. Um, the division between spirit-based and sympathetic magic is not really clean and sharp and well-defined, and there's a lot of crossover, and a lot of magic involves both at the same time in different measures. So I mentioned Solomonic Pentacles. Solomonic Pentacles, like, yes, they're sympathetic magic in a certain sense, but also you're making these pentacles in a ritual framework where you are evoking and calling on the powers of various spirits, including planetary spirits, to sort of charge or empower or give virtue to this pentacle that you're producing. So there's a little bit of both happening there. Um, you know, likewise, if you're 
asking a familiar spirit to go do some work for you, you may give that spirit an offering of something that's related to the nature of the work that you're trying to do in order to help guide their actions or something like that. And that would be sort of a sympathetic element that's coming into what is otherwise a, a spirit-based magical practice. Um, so I don't mean to imply that these are like there's, there's a sharp division between these two forms of magic, but I think that fundamentally uh, these are two different ways of understanding w how you're trying to make your magic happen. Are you trying to make your magic happen by leveraging similarities or images or symbolic connections between things that you're manipulating and things in the world? Or are you trying to make your magic happen through the intercession of a spirit that is more powerful than you? Uh, and then you may pull in elements of the other kind of model in order to help flesh out and, and you know, lend strength to whatever magic you're doing. Um, so interestingly, I think there's this, this conversation about like magical power that gets bandied around a lot in certain spaces. Uh, and the idea of raising power for a spell is a relatively recent phenomenon in the history of magic. Um, mm, I'm going to make a claim here, totally open to this claim being wrong, but from what I can see sort of in the shape of the history of Western occultism, it looks to me like the idea of raising power as being a central feature of a spell or of magical working is something that really comes onto the scene, or at least comes into prominence, with the rise of Wicca. So prior to Wicca, most magical systems aren't going to rely on raising power. They're either going to rely on the power of the intercessory spirits that you're calling on, uh, or they're going to rely on the natural virtues of, you know, whatever, like the horseshoe that you're hanging above your front door to keep away bad luck. And there's an expectation that the horseshoe just does that on its own, and you don't need to raise power or empower that object in any way. So the idea of, like, raising power as a means of spellcasting, to my eye at least, really looks like something that comes to prominence with Wicca. Um, but it's also something you really only see in sympathetic models of magic and in a certain kind of sympathetic model of magic. Um, so like I say, there are other forms of sympathetic magic, like the horseshoe or like planting the placenta under a sapling, that are sort of expected to just work without having to raise any additional power because the things that you're doing have these natural virtues of their own that are sort of affecting this sympathetic link and causing the change that you want to see. Um, there's a good deal of like hidden Aristotelian metaphysics in that model of magic, which might be an interesting thing worth exploring in another video. I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to that. But, um, but so, you know, I, I think that that's just really helpful to keep in mind when we're talking about magic and when we're talking about magic with other practitioners who have different approaches to magic, walk different paths. Um, because if I'm talking to a Solomonic magician and he's saying like, oh, you know, golly gee, I don't understand why this working I did wasn't really working. Um, for me to say something like, oh, well, like, did you raise power is probably not going to be helpful because that's not a, an essential feature of that kind of model of particularly spirit-based magic. Um, my own magic tends to be more sympathetic than spirit-based, but I certainly do a measure of both, right? So I do a lot of interaction with particular kinds of spirits, and I think most uh, most magical practitioners are interacting with spirits, even if they're doing a lot of sympathetic magic. Uh, so whether they are religious practitioners who are worshipping deities, whether they're doing any kind of ancestor work or necromantic work more broadly, whether they're interacting with spirits of land, spirits of place, elemental spirits. I tweeted something recently about how I am currently in the process of trying to befriend my local lake. Um, that sounds kind of insane, but I actually really sincerely mean it. Like, I'm just going and hanging out with the lake and talking to the lake about my day and, like, bringing some water to give to the lake and just, like, establishing a connection there, uh, which I take as a kind of spirit interaction. Um, now, am I going to 
ask the lake to help me in my magic. I don't currently have any plans to do that. Maybe if the time came and there was a kind of magic that I needed to do that I think the lake would be particularly helpful with. But I'm like, I'm in the process of cultivating that relationship just for the sake of having that spirit relationship. Um, so even practitioners who have largely sympathetic approaches to spellcasting may still build spirit relationships, may still have interactions with spirits of various kinds. And likewise, you know, I think um, even practitioners who are really working almost exclusively through the intercession of particular spirits with whom they have built up relationships may still find value in uh, certain kinds of sympathetic magic, certain kinds of establishing symbolic connections, because magic works through symbolism, at least in part. And so, for example, if you're petitioning a spirit to help you with wealth, uh, you may make an incense that is made out of herbs that have particular sort of money-drawing associations. And that's a type of sympathetic work uh, that would fit very naturally into a spirit-based model. Um, so, you know, these, these two things cross over. There's a great deal of overlap. But I think they do fundamentally represent two different orientations toward magic. Um, and so when I think about what magic is... I want to make sure that we're including both of those things. Magic to me is the art of effecting change um, through particular ritualistic methods that draw on the aid of intercessory spirits and or uh, symbolic and sympathetic connections in the world. Uh, that's about all I have to say for today. So, oh, no, I have, to, I have book recommendations. Um, so I've already talked about a couple of books, um, The Golden Bough, Three Books of Occult Philosophy, you know, The Picatrix, um, Isaac Bonowitz in Real Magic. Real Magic is a good book, but it's extremely outdated, and you, like, I don't know. Um, anyways, Real Magic, worth reading for the sake of, like, understanding the history of 20th century magic. Uh, that relies on a very sympathetic model of magic. So Isaac Bonowitz gives this model of magic um, where he talks about three M's, mandala, mantra, mudra, as sort of the ways of establishing a connection and raising power. You have some kind of a physical representation of the thing that you want to achieve. You have some kind of actions that you're performing and repeating, and then you have some kind of way of uh, raising power uh, or words or focused intent or something like that. Um, so Bonowitz's model of magic, very, very sympathetic, as opposed to the kinds of magic that you find in the grimoires, um, in Enochian magic, and so on. Uh, you'll also see, right, like, unsurprisingly, Wiccan authors tend to leverage a sympathetic model of magic. So the Ferrers have a book called Spells and How They Work, very, very sympathetic. Doreen Valiente has a book called Natural Magic, very, very sympathetic. Um, in general, I think if you want to, I have one, like, primary book recommendation each for spirit-based and sympathetic models of magic. For spirit-based magic, there is Consorting with Spirits by Jason Miller. Uh, it's a relatively recent book. I think maybe it came out last year or the year before, something like that. 2022 came out last year. Um, it's a very, very good book. It's very accessible. It talks about sort of the ways that you can build up relationships with different kinds of spirits, and then how to put those relationships into action in order to accomplish magical results. Um, for sympathetic magic, I've recommended this book elsewhere on the channel, but Magical Power for Beginners by Deborah Lipp uh, is a very good primer on uh, establishing sympathetic connections and using them for magic. And in particular, as you might get from the title, this is uh, an approach to magic that relies very heavily on this idea of raising power as a way of making a spell go. So both of those books I highly recommend. Uh, they're very, very different approaches to magic, and I think there's something good to be had from reading both of them. Because um, like I say, no one's magic is entirely just one or the other. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got. So I am pre-recording this video. I'm out of town this week, but I will try to schedule it to come up sometime this week. And in the meantime, uh, I'll talk to you sometime soon. Bye.